Game Cool Books, Episode 27, True, Every Word. Captivity opens with that dominant image from the last chapter of the fog. Svalbard's fire mines never actually appear in the story, but its role as prison, thus as an analog for hell, is reinforced in other ways, such as by this enfolding grayness into which Lyra can't hope to escape for fear of falling from the cliffs. As happened during her other capture by the Samoyed hunters, Lyra comes close to despair here. She might have been the only human on Svalbard, and Yorick might have been dead, she imagines, with that limited imagination of hers. Even so, there are signs of hope. The sounds of the waves and the cliff ghasts fade and grow fainter, but the sound of the birds suggests there is still a kind of life here. And between them, the fog and the birds, it makes for a theatrical first glimpse of the palace. Look up, said the bear, as a waft of breeze moved aside the heavy curtain of the fog. There was little daylight in any case, but Lyra did look and found herself standing in front of a vast building of stone. It was at least as tall as the highest part of Jordan College, but much more massive and carved all over with representations of warfare, showing bears victorious and scrailing, surrendering, showing Tartars chained and slaving in the fire mines, showing zeppelins flying from all parts of the world bearing gifts and tributes to the king of the bears, Jofor Rachnison. At least that was what the bear sergeant told her the carving showed. She had to take his word for it, because every projection and ledge on the deeply sculpted facade was occupied by gannets and scoots, which cawed and shrieked and wheeled constantly around overhead, whose droppings had coated every part of the building with thick smears of dirty white. The introduction to the palace and to the civilization that it represents through its public art goes back to Aeneas's arrival in Carthage, and architecture as a monument to Vanity recalls the Tower of Babel. The classical illusions are still more marked in the next chapter's combat, as we'll see. But what Pullman does with the classic image here is quite more, a bit more subversive as he plasters the carvings with bird droppings. Besides that echo of Jordan College and its massiveness, then, this other white should recall Bullfanger, which no one on Svalbard yet seems to know has been burned down. It's a powerful symbol for the way that the classics, as a discipline, are largely, largely buried now beneath the squabbles over racism and elitism, just as at Bolvanger, the scientific progress is liable to consume itself in the destructive powers it has unleashed and tries to use. Like many of the bigoted proponents of either extreme, the Luddite classicists or the positivist scientists, the bears themselves seem not to see the mess, and they go on extolling the wonders that their pupil actually can't see for the layers of hypocrisy and prejudice smeared on top. Fortunately, there are also still a few great teachers out there, classically trained and in touch with the unsullied tradition, and Lyra has met one. All the bears that she sees in the palace, she compares to Yorick and finds them wanting. Her reasoning lays stress on the distinction, which will come out again in the next chapter. His armor is real armor. Rust-colored, blood-stained, dented with combat, not elegant, enameled, and decorative like most of what she saw around her now. Lyra's comparisons suggest the crucial authority and desirability of authenticity, something she can judge at a glance after her time with Yorick and all that they've been through together. The palace interior like its guards and its exterior, suggests 
the same distinction. Besides the decorations trodden with filth, there's also a smell. Rancid, seal fat, dung, blood, refuse of every sort. Elira's reaction is immediate and not due to any reasoning whatsoever. In the fitful lighting of so different from Bolvanger's, she hopes the bears can't read her human expression of disgust. And meanwhile, she's caught off guard herself, knocked into the dungeon and locked up. At this point, Fan shows off an ability we haven't seen before in the story, becoming a firefly to put out light of his own. By that light, for the first time in who knows how long, Lyra actually reads the alethiometer. Pantalaimon flew down to her wrist and sat there glowing while Lyra composed her mind. With a part of her, she found it remarkable that she could sit here in terrible danger and yet sink into the calm she needed to read the alethiometer. And yet it was so much a part of her now that the most complicated questions sorted themselves out into their constituent symbols as naturally as her muscles moved her limbs. She hardly had to think about them. So, developing the analogies we've heard about all along, and in line with Serafina Pecola's discussion of Lyra's nature and her growing awareness, she reads more naturally than ever. The image of a reader reading by the light they themselves shed on the work without conscious effort, is a powerful affirmation of our responsibility as readers. The setting in a prism also plays on classical prototypes, from Plato's cave in the Republic to Boethius's consolation of philosophy. Her first question, after the preliminary concern for its condition, after so much banging about, and that inner consciousness dawning that it's quite remarkable for her to be able to read it at all, is about Yorick. She asks, where is Yorick? And the answer came at once, a day's journey away, carried there by the balloon after your crash, but hurrying this way. Surprisingly, she doesn't ask about any of the others. Perhaps she would have, given more time. And from a narrative standpoint, this is helpful for keeping our attention on what matters right now. But it's a little surprising, too, the way the answer comes, passing over the images directly into words, given quotation marks around them to represent their speech-like fluency. That meaning flowing like reflected light between the alethiometer and its reader. The answers and her further questions offer a kind of window into the mind of the storyteller, hinting at Yorick's intentions. He intends to break into the palace and rescue you in the face of all the difficulties. She wishes, ominously as it turns out, well, only much later after her passage to the world of the dead, she wishes that she were able to send Pan far away to carry messages to Yorick like a witch. Suddenly, another voice breaks in, a man's. Pan changes at once from his vulnerable firefly form to a frantic bat, but Lyra recovers quickly and coaxes him back, putting his wavering point of light to use once more, this time not to read, but to better see her surroundings. And the situation's frightening enough at first, but it soon becomes an odd sort of comic relief. After all, it wasn't a heap of rags, but a man chained to the wall, his demon a weary-looking serpent in his lap. This Yotham Santelia, his name and title are a puzzle. Could he refer to the futurist architect? It's the first thing that comes up if you Google it. Maybe to the place in Italy or to the prophet, even, that the place is apparently named for, Elijah. The name is a bit like Cooper. That was one of the doctors of Bolvanger. 
that surname resurfaces as Will's piano teacher. It's uh, in a subtle knife. Also, uh, Santelia will be a town in the world of Sitagatsi. Perhaps Pullman just likes the way it sounds. Coincidences abound here. When Lyra mentions Oxford, he bursts out. Is that scoundrel Trelawney still there? Eh? The Palmyrian professor? Yes, she said. Is he by God? Eh? They should have forced his resignation long ago. Duplicitous plagiarist. Coxcomb! Lyra made a neutral sound. Uh, he's going to pepper his speech with distinguished insults like this throughout the scene. Before Lyra gets quite up to speed with his language, he demands, has he published his paper on gamma ray photons yet? Um, and then she, out of habit, no, I remember now, he said he still needed to check some figures, and he said he was going to write about dust as well. That's it. So her attempts to shift the conversation and starting with dust follow from her habitual lying, uh, and maybe from her sense of politeness about not saying, I don't know, when someone asks her a question, uh, but also from her pity for the poor, mad, captive, Regius professor of cosmology. Um, his captivity is double, as he's not only stuck in the cell and chained but trapped in his own madness, trapped, in a sense, in the past, to the point of physical derangement. He's spitting, hitting himself, possibly having fits. Yet his lethargic demon suggests that some deep part of him is uncannily tranquil, detached from it all, as with the Bolvanger adults who lacked all curiosity. His madness, manifested in the estrangement between his behavior and his demons, such that he doesn't seem to wonder at how unlikely it is for Lyra to be acquainted with the very man who figured in his obsession. Lyra does notice, of course, and she tries to glean what information she can. More pressing than her interest in dust, she tries to find out about the bears. I mean, for example, said Lyra, I bet you know more about the bears than he does for a start. Bears, said the old man. Ha! I could write a treatise on them. That's why they shut me away, you know. Um, and so she has to turn his outburst about Trelawney's plagiarism back again to the topic. Apparently, with some justification, he claims he could write a treatise because such a work does appear in a list of publications included in Lyra's Oxford. He, uh, he knows things, he insists vaguely. Um, yes, I have friends. Yes, powerful friends. Yeah, said Lyra, and I bet you'd be a wonderful teacher being as you got so much knowledge and experience. Uh, in response to her inveiglement here, a bit of common sense, we're told, flickered. His suspicion is not quite on target, I would say. It's not exactly sarcasm, but not exactly a genuine desire to learn what he knows, either. Something else as she has done with the Jordan scholars, and the Palmyrian professor, probably among them, Lyra pacifies him with a look of bland admiration. Such a move took in even the laser-like focus of Lord Boreal, so the scattered Santilia is no match. Echoing the language of that common sense flickering in the image of Pan's firefly glow, he effuses uh, give me the right pupil, and I will light a fire in his mind. 
He seems convinced. But Lyra keeps laying it on to make him accept her as such a pupil. She speaks of transmitting knowledge, which is a very different thing from having it filched. Um, but maybe a different thing, too, from lighting a fire in someone else's mind. Flattering him, she claims she isn't clever enough for cosmology, but that practicing on bare lore, maybe they can work up to dust. There are echoes here of other classical discussions on the hierarchy of the disciplines, with uh, theology in the Middle Ages holding the top spot. I think there's a passage where the angel Raphael in Milton's Paradise Lost suggests that Adam and Eve, in their unfallen state, might even have risen through the great chain of being to attain to something spiritual. Santillia here refers to the microcosm and the macrocosm. That's another classic mode of interpreting reality, which reached a flowering in the Renaissance with Giordano Bruno. His ecstatic exclamations, the stars are alive, child. Did you know that? Everything out there is alive, and there are grand purposes abroad. The universe is full of intentions, you know. Everything happens for a purpose. Your purpose is to remind me of that. Good, good. In my despair, I had forgotten. Good. Excellent, my child. See, there's all sorts of echoes here. There's Lyra imagining the scholar listening to the star demons. There's her intimations of being surrounded by dark questions with intentions. And there's the troubling sense of despair that so many people fall into that might actually be a kind of forgetting of their place in the cosmos. And still more troubling the thought that this in turn might be a delusion since it's voiced by a madman here. This string of exaltations might parody the sort of wisdom that we heard from Serafina in the previous chapter or from Pullman himself in his uh, essays and interviews, but hopefully it does not wholly undercut it by exposing it to a certain amount of ridicule or pathos, as the case may be. We learn, if we can trust him, that Centelio was invited to set up a university for Yofor. This is news that we were told back in the retiring room as a joke, and he claims that he was betrayed in these efforts. Oh, was it not in the retiring room? Maybe it was in the party at Mrs. Coulter's. And anyhow, Santillia claims he was betrayed in these efforts by the cold shoulder of the Royal Arctic Institute, whose clubhouse he did visit with Mrs. Coulter, and by lies and calumny of lesser men, slanders on his credentials, the bitterness of his fall is that of the scholar lured into administration, the seeker of truth undone by backstabbing university politics. Some justification might lurk in his claim that he derived the final proof of the Barnard Stokes hypothesis, because if so, he too would have been persona non grata with the church and rivals would have had a strong incentive to use that to take him down. The pettiness of his ambition and the violence of his impotent wrath are captured pathetically here. I'll be out one day, you'll see. I'll be vice-chancellor, oh yes. Let Trelawney come to me then begging for mercy. Let the Publications Committee of the Royal Arctic Institute spurn my contributions then. Ha! I'll expose them all. Oh, boy. The criticism of academia, which has been implicit in Lyra's character all through, and comes out more in what she says to Lee at that one point, especially scholars. And this all seems just as prevalent, if not quite so well attested, as the salient hatred of the church that readers find in Pullman. While he frequently talks about 
the latter, his critiques of the former are manifold too, and he actually lays out constructive alternatives to address both, that is, academia and the church, with his larger program of building the Republic of Heaven, as he talks about it in one essay, and responsibility and delight, which he talks about in others. Lyra learns her key pieces of new information when she declares that Yorick is on his way. Then they'll kill him. He's not a bear, you see. He's an outcast, like me. Degraded, you see. Not entitled to any of the privileges of a bear. Supposing Yorick Birnison did come back, though, Lyra said. Supposing he challenged Yofa Rackness into a fight. Oh, they wouldn't allow it, said the professor decisively. Yofer would never lower himself to acknowledge Yorick Birnison's right to fight him. Hasn't got a right. Yorick might as well be a seal now, or a walrus, not a bear. Or worse, tartar or scraling. They wouldn't fight him honorably like a bear. They'd kill him with the fire hurlers before he got near. Not a hope. No mercy. Hmm. So you can see that Lyra is already thinking like Pullman was in that essay. He talked about having the idea of having the the combat between the bears, um, but it's going to be more complicated than that. It's dispiriting, but there's nothing she can do about it at this point. Perhaps it's that comparison between himself and Yorick that reminds her of the bear's other analog in Lord Asriel, and that's what she asks him about next. She asks, where are the other prisoners? And uh, he says, other prisoners? Like Lord Asriel? Suddenly, the professor's manner changed altogether. He cringed and shrank back against the wall and shook his head warningly. Um, forbidden, very dangerous. Yofa Rackneson will not allow him to be mentioned. As always, what is forbidden is what we are most interested to find out about. This injunction against so much as saying Lord Asriel's name is complicated by what follows. We learn that Yofer is besotted with Mrs. Coulter and is acting on her orders in keeping Lord Asriel prisoner. But he can't help acceding to Asriel's demands for equipment. He wants to name a city after her and yet must, for some mysterious reason, help her dire foe and former lover, speaking whose name he would have punished with death. So, playing a difficult game, to be sure. And again, Centelia casts a comical veneer of scientism over everything here. Can't last, this equilibrium. Unstable, pleasing both sides, eh? The wave function of this situation is going to collapse quite soon. I have it on good authority. Really, said Lyra, her mind elsewhere, furiously thinking about what she just heard. Yes, my demon's tongue can taste probability, you know. Yeah, mine too. When do they feed us, Professor? So, his foolish impracticality comes in again here. He honestly doesn't seem to know whether the seal bones, to say nothing, of his continued life are evidence that the bears do give their prisoners food from time to time. In this, Santilia looks something like the Laputians in Gulliver's Travels, who are so obsessed with speculative science that they need reminders that they have bodies. <laughs> it's after he starts snoring, and after Lyra has tried the door with no success, and when Pan, tired of putting out his light, turns into a bat, and all. that's all very well for him, after all that, Lyra suddenly remembers what she couldn't before, and what the Palmyrian professor had said about Yofer. What Yofer Rackneson wanted more than anything else, Professor Trelawney had said, was a demon. Of course, she hadn't understood what he meant. He'd spoken of Panzerbjörna instead of using the English word, so she didn't know he was talking about bears, and she had no idea that Yofer Rackneson wasn't a man and a man would have had a demon anyway, so it hadn't made sense. But now it was plain. Everything she'd heard about the Bear King added up. 
The mighty Jofra Rackneson wanted nothing more than to be a human being with a demon of his own. In this, Jofra is the opposite of the gobblers who are trying to cut humans away from their demons. And perhaps it's this connection that gives Lyra her new idea. As she thought that, a plan came to her, a way of making Jofra Ragnarsson do what he would normally never have done, a way of restoring Yorick Birnison to his rightful throne, a way, finally, of getting to the place where they had put Lord Azriel and taking him the alethiometer. The idea hovered and shimmered delicately like a soap bubble, and she dared not even look at it directly in case it burst. But she was familiar with the way of ideas, and she let it shimmer, looking away, thinking about something else. This mystery of the memory coming back to her remains unexplained. This is not required by the story. Pullman could have had her ask the alethiometer and find out that way. But that he deliberately leaves it unexplained suggests, again, the important role of negative capability, which is manifested here in her approach to the idea once she has it, that there is such a thing as, as indirect learning, as learning that won't show up for some time, it won't be obvious when it does, and learning that's not reducible to standardized test, which Pullman is fond of criticizing. So when the door opens for some food, she has Pan hidden, just as he was when the first bear guards found her after her crash landing, but this time it's according to this plan and it's not fortuitous. There's a sequence of mystifications of the bear guards escalating up the chain of command with variations on a simple insight. Lyra was sure her interpretation of things was right. Jofra Rackneson was introducing so many new ways that none of the bears was certain yet how to behave, and she could exploit this uncertainty in order to get to Jofra. And the way she does this, interestingly, is with politeness, an appeal to politeness. She first saw the power of this in Mrs. Coulter's company. Once she's admitted into the state quarters, after a brief glimpse of the glittering stars in the courtyard, glittering like Santelia's eyes, Lyra confronts the contradictions of Yofer's rule. It was no cleaner here, and in fact, the air was even harder to breathe than in the cell, because all the natural stinks had been overlaid by a heavy layer of cloying perfume. She was made to wait in a corridor, then in an anteroom, then outside a large door, while bears discussed and argued and scurried back and forth, and she had time to look around at the preposterous decoration. The walls were rich with gilt plasterwork, some of which was already peeling off or crumbling with damp, and the floored carpets were trodden with filth. Finally, the large door was opened from the inside. A blaze of light from half a dozen chandeliers, a crimson carpet, and more of that thick perfume hanging in there, and the faces of a dozen or more bears, all gazing at her. None in armor, but each with some kind of decoration. A golden necklace, a headdress of purple feathers, a crimson sash. Curiously, the room was also occupied by birds, terns and skewers, perched on the plaster cornice and swooped low to snatch at bits of fish that had fallen out of one another's nests in the chandeliers. Once more, Lyra is present where she should not be allowed, among an inner circle of great distinction, and like in the rafters of the Zal, here the birds have their nests squabbling over bits of fish. With echoes of Satan's throne in Paradise Lost and of the dais, from the dining hall of Jordan, Yofor Rackneson appears. And on a dais at the far end of the room, a mighty throne reared up high. It was made of granite for strength and massiveness, 
but like so many other things in Yofra's palace, it was decorated with over-elaborate swags and festoons of gilt that looked like tinsel on a mountainside. Sitting on the throne was the biggest bear she had ever seen. Yofra Ragnarsson was even taller and bulkier than York, and his face was much more mobile and expressive, with a kind of humanness in it, which she had never seen in York's. When Yofra looked at her, she seemed to see a man looking out of his eyes, the sort of man she had met at Mrs. Coulter's, a subtle politician used to power. He was wearing a heavy gold chain around his neck, with a gaudy jewel hanging from it, and his claws, a good six inches long, were each covered in gold leaf. The effect was one of enormous strength and energy and craft. He was quite big enough to carry the absurd overdecoration. On him, it didn't look preposterous. It looked barbaric and magnificent. So, in his mighty size and expressive face, he embodies the contradictions that he has sought to impose upon Svalbard. But on him, they work. Or seem to. Again, the word subtle adorns him. Faced with this awesome reality, which she knows something about, but knows enough to see that some of it escapes her knowledge. Lyra doubts her plan. We might too, if we knew yet what it was. But then she takes heart, and we get a hint, seeing that in his lap Yofer has a Mrs. Coulter doll, just like the ones we heard about at Bolvanger, and from York, the time that Lyra freed him from his captivity. And she knew she was safe. Meaning, I take it, that when she places herself in jeopardy, having enticed the king to clear the room by dropping clues about Yorick and demons, and then uttering the most dangerous thing she had ever said, it's like when she was lying to Mrs. Coulter. She's in an artistic zone. And Yofer, crafty as he is, the flies left his mouth like tiny words, we're told. It's reminiscent of Beelzebub, the lord of the flies. He still allows himself to be carried away by Lyra's wiles. This boils down, as Pan says, to flattery, combined with tidbits that Lyra's learned from her travels, which is demons' ability to separate the Bolvanger experiments and with convincing analogies. Whereas the other bears she proceeded through because they didn't know who they were, with Yofer, she leads him along with the promise that he can finally and unmistakably be who he thinks that he knows that he is. She shares her great secret and Yorick's with him, supposedly that she is a demon belonging to York Birnison. And then she discovers Yofer's secrets by a demonic power which she promises to reveal once he defeats York and claims her for his own. The single combat that she persuades him to, uh, to agree to starts to worry her as soon as she secures it, though it would be better than being hit with the fire hurlers. The fight with this giant among giant bears looks dubious. Perhaps further concessions would have been what she was after if Pan had not nipped her to keep her from abusing her power. Oh, it's possible, I suppose, that she would have tried to use it to make the king do something silly or self-destructive instead. At any rate, Besides telling her how close Yorick is and the answers to Yofor's test questions about his Oedipal encounter with his father on the ice and his ambition to be baptized, further deceit practiced upon him by the Lady Coulter, making her an effective matador cape for Lyra to wave before him, misdirecting him. Besides all this, the alethiometer also tells her to trust Yorick. And this reminds us of what the Witch Queen saw, that his destiny is bound up with hers. And 
also of her more general point in the conversation she had with Lee about the proper attitude with which to face one's fate. That trust sets one free, whereas Yofor, with his gold chain, and now his beholdenness to Lyra and to his own pretensions, Yofor is a captive. Now, if this were a fairy tale, there probably would have been a third test to go with the other two questions. Um, and maybe, in some ways, the third test comes when Lyra uh, feels that she has such power over him, it's almost intoxicating. And in that moment, Pantalaimon nipped her hand sharply to remind her of the danger they were all in. And she came back to herself, and stepped modestly back to watch and wait. So those dizzying possibilities that she could do anything, that uh, flattering claim that she thinks he's a new god, um, that incredible power that she says that Yorick acquired on gaining a demon, all of that is, um, is almost carrying her away, but it is her demon which keeps her grounded, so that the true power, again, seems to be a kind of humility, after all. Um, we get one more mention of a time frame, uh, four hours, which is helpful as it uh, gives us a sense of Lyra's um, curiosity about these things. So maybe we're not entirely wrong to wonder about them from time to time ourselves. Um, of course, she also gets uh, Yofor to allow her to pretend uh, that she got lost. So she will have a chance, at least briefly, to go and talk to Yorick before the battle, and we'll see that in the next chapter. She also convinces him to not tell the other bears why he's doing this, why he thinks he's doing this, but instead to say that he called Yorick here, um, rather than having Yorick come of his own free will to rescue Lyra. That power to call from a great distance, as she implies, if they believe that he has that, then they'll think that he can do anything. So all of these kinds of power, these, uh, uh, which seem to be opposed, um, we'll have to consider again when we see uh, Lord Asriel at last, because he seems to have a similar sort of power. In fact, though, um, no doubt it is almost intoxicating. In the final sentence of the chapter, um, we hear this. But as she came to herself and stepped modestly back to watch and wait as the bears, under Yofor's excited direction, prepared the combat ground for Yorick Birnison. And meanwhile, Yorick, knowing nothing about it, was hurrying ever closer toward what she wished she could tell him was a fight for his life. In that, we get the point of view, a kind of blend of Yorick's and Lyra's and the alethiometers, which uh, towards the end there sort of shades into melodrama, certainly makes you want to read on, of course. Um, we'll see some more examples of the alethiometer uh, becoming more assertive in the next chapter again. But for now, it's time for recess. This time, the imaginary video game adaptation, I think, would hew pretty closely to everything through the arrival at the palace up to Lyra's imprisonment and her meeting with Santelia. But at that point, I think you would be able to play through his story, at least some sections of it, Maybe when he's welcomed to Svalbard to establish the university. That would give you a chance to explore the palace and its surroundings in its pristine state, to see its decorations in their initial splendor, and then in the next scenes to watch them gradually decline. Because then time would jump ahead to when Mrs. Coulter comes to visit. 
and when it would be Centelia's job to cover for the equipment that Lord Azriel had sent for by claiming that it was his, that he was going to use it for the university. And I think Mrs. Coulter would probably be clever enough to see through that. And maybe that would be part of his downfall, too, because the final scene would involve the arrival of Trelawney among the team of inspectors, and it would show Santelia's ignominious fall. And that might also involve his proof of the Barnard Stokes hypothesis that he claims he made, uh, presuming that to be the case. And we would also see the theft of his work on gamma ray photons, which seems to be implied here. Um, and probably the gamma ray photon gun could be a weapon that would be unlocked much later for the intention craft. Um, but at this stage, the ability that you'd unlock would be Pantalaimon's serpent forms to allow him to taste probability on his tongue. Um, maybe that would be part of his demon senses uh, hitherto um, uh, uh, rather locked. Um, and same goes for his ability to glow as a firefly. Anyway, a secondary quest would involve you um, playing out Yofor's fight with his father, the solitary bear on the ice, so that you could get a bit of practice in bear combat-wise before the final uh, boss battle in, in the next chapter. Or, sorry, not the final, but, you know, a major one. Um, you'd even get, maybe, to play around with convincing the great bear king to do all sorts of frivolous things if you wanted to, though the consequences of this would be for him to begin to mistrust you, and so it would really be better to listen to Pan's warning and to exercise restraint. But maybe could at least pass some of those four intervening hours imagining the sorts of things that Lyra could have got the Bear King to do. Um, Anyhow, we will meet again for Mortal Kombat next time, and we'll have plenty to say about the game then. Till then, thanks for listening. Take care. The podcast you just heard was made using Anchor. Ever thought about making your own podcast? Anchor makes it really easy for anyone to get started. It's a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing podcasts. Best of all, it's 100% free. Sign up now at anchor.fm slash new. That's anchor.fm slash new to get started.